I want to go over what we went through last week. Uh, we're in chapter 11, John chapter 11. And we went through, I think, like the first 27 verses. Uh, if you recall the major theme of, of what happened, if, if you remember, uh, Lazarus passed away, right? right? And they asked Jesus to come over to heal him. Did Jesus do that? No, no. Matter of fact, Jesus did what? Two more days, days, right? And and he didn't show up until the fourth day. And we we talked about that. What was the importance of importance of him showing up on the fourth day? So what God could do, but exactly right. They they had they had a, a a tradition, a superstition, basically that for three days. The spirit would hang around, the soul would hang around the grave and have a possibility to come back into the body and the body could come alive. Well, Jesus knew that. So he waited till the fourth day. Hmm. That way, there could be no question how this man right. comes back to life. And then something interesting happens. Remember, he says, well, he tells he tells Martha that Lazarus is going to rise again. and, and, and Martha says, yeah, I know he's going to rise again. He's going to rise on the last day, on the resurrection day. But Jesus had a different idea, right? He's talking about right here, right now. Mm -hmm. So that basically got us back up to where we left off last week. And I think we made it through the first 27 verses, but I actually want to start in verse 25 tonight. Hey, Tony. Yeah. Before you get started, do you happen to know how they come up with a superstition like that? Just... Somebody I don't, but how does any superstition come upon? I mean, just like, remember they had the other one, they had a teaching going around at the Pool of Siloam that, that the sick could come down and huddle around the water, and the angels would come down there so often and stir the water, and if they could touch water, they could be healed. You know, there's a lot of things like that in the religious... You know, a lot of the, a lot of the traditions that were in Judaism wasn't necessarily scriptural. A lot of them were man-made traditions and superstitions. And this, this was one of them. You know, we even think of, you know, my first thought was, well, if he showed up on the third day, that would make sense. Because Jesus rose on the third day. And I got to thinking, there's got to be some reason it was the fourth day. And I started doing this background information, and it was all tied to that. For three days, they believed a person could... The soul could be reunited with the body, and the person could rise again to life. But on the fourth day, the soul would leave, the spirit would leave, mm-hmm. and then there was no chance of it. Well, that's why Jesus showed up. Right. Tony, is, is yeah. there anything in the Bible that says that about waiting, you know, for the fourth day to come? Mm-hmm. If you go back and you look at, if you look in um, some of the books, the Hebrew books, the Jewish okay. books, it'll talk about some of the Jewish superstitions, okay. some of the Jewish traditions. And that's one of the traditions that it talks about, and that ties directly to this whole story of Lazarus and why Jesus showed up on the fourth day. But as far as he, are you going to find it in scriptures where it says the reason Jesus showed up on the fourth day is because of this? No, no. But if you do like a pastor should do, your diligence when you're doing a Bible study and you study it out, you find it. You, you, there's information you, you can find it, but it's not directly in the Bible. Okay. But to answer your question, why, where they got that, I, I really don't know. Um, like I said, they, they had many traditions that were man-made traditions. They had many superstitions that were man-made superstitions that had nothing to do with the Word of God or what God said. Into like now. Yeah. People got, people got some funny, funny things that they, they think that God had. Said I'll, I'll give you one example. I'll give you one example without picking on a particular religion. Well, I'm just going to come out and say it, and I'm going to make some people mad. Catholics. I was raised as a Catholic as a young, you know, young lad. Me too. But where in the world do they get all those rituals and all that? The, that you won't find that in, in Scripture book. anywhere. That's man-made just traditions just in, their book. in their books because they wrote a special book. It's got things in the, mm-hmm. their Bible that's not in mm-hmm. the regular Christian Bible. But some of the traditions and some of the things that they've added, see, has nothing to do with the Word of God. And in the same way, the Jews were doing that back then. 
the, and this was one of them. The Mormons, the Mormons do it too. Well, the Mormons is just a cult, period. Yeah. They don't even believe in the same, everything's different about Mormonism. But, but we're getting off track, so but she, to answer your question, I don't know for sure. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. But I find it interesting that he specifically, because think about it, I kept thinking when I first read it, I said there's got to be something there. Because I know the love and the compassion of Jesus Christ, and I know how much he loved these three. Mm -hmm. And I thought there's got to be some reason he waited two extra days and showed up on the fourth day. Why would he wait extra days and make them two poor women suffer two more days and grieve two more days? Mm -hmm. There had to be a reason. That was the reason. Mm -hmm. He wanted everybody to know. He truly was the Son of God. And this man was going to come back to life because of the power of God. Right. To bring God glory. That, right. That's why he did it. Yeah. Okay. So when he tells her that he's going to bring him back, she's thinking of the resurrection in the last day. Right. I want to start in verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop there for just really quick because I... I found it very interesting that you guys have heard of the great I am statements that Jesus makes right. in the book of John, right? Yes. This is one of them, yep. okay? I am the resurrection and life. Do you know that there's, most of you probably know this, do you know that there's seven of them, seven that he makes? I just thought I would go through them. The seven great I am statements that Jesus makes. One, he says, I am the bread of life. Mm -hmm. He told us this, in chapter 6, verse 35. We already went through that previously. The other one, he says, I am the light of the world. That's in chapter 8, verse 12. Mm -hmm. He says, I am the door. Remember that whole thing about the sheep gate. He's yeah, the right. door, and that's how yeah. you get in. That was in chapter 10, verse 7. He says, I am the good shepherd. That was in chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. And here he says, I am the resurrection of and the life. I want to spend just a little bit of time on that. I am the resurrection and the life. Does he say, I have the resurrection no, and the life? I am. I am. I am. You guys, I don't think we understand how important that is. Jesus Christ is the resurrection. Yes. He is going to be the first to be resurrected from the dead. That's going to live forever and ever and ever. And through Jesus Christ, that's the way everybody's going to be resurrected. He is literally the resurrection. He is literally the life. He is literally eternal life. In Jesus Christ, there is no other way. And that's the point he's trying to make. You know, and then later in the book of John, he'll say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yes. That's chapter 14, verse 6. Yep. We'll be coming to that. And then... One of my favorite verses, one of the verses is very controversial that I'm very looking forward to, the great I am the vine statement that he talks about in this very book, chapter 15, verses 1. That whole section about he is the, he is the vine. The point I'm trying to make is, and you've heard me say this before, the main purpose of the book of John was to show the deity of Jesus Christ. When he says, I am, you understand what that means, right? Think back to Old Testament. How did God present himself to Moses? I am. I am that I am. I am that I am. He was the one in the burning bush. Do you understand that Jesus is saying, that's me? That's me. I am. That's the one that you read about. The one that was in the burning bush. The one that would come before Moses and said, I am, but I am. And told him to take his very sandals off because he was on holy ground. That is Jesus Christ saying, I am. I am he. And that's why he goes through so much time where he tries to show the deity of Jesus Christ. And that's where Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Same essence, same character, same deity. Two persons, one God. But this is hugely important, and I think most of you in this room understand this, but hugely important that you understand the deity of Jesus Christ and who he truly is.
Much more than Messiah. Mm -hmm. Much more than just Savior. He is God in the flesh. He is the Son of God. He is Lord of Lords. He is King of Kings. It tells us right here, there is no other way to be resurrected. Yes. He is the very resurrection. He is the very life. Everything that revolves in a Christian's life is through the person of Jesus Christ. The Father has made no other way. He is all in all. He completed everything that you read about in the Old Testament. It all pointed to Jesus Christ. It was all about Him. All the prophecies, everything, the old sacrifices, the old religious system, the old covenant, it all pointed towards who? Jesus, Jesus. Christ. I am. We need to grab hold of how powerful that is and who Jesus right. truly, truly is. Amen? Amen? I just wanted to spend a little time. Like I said, I think most of you got a, a good handle on who Jesus really is. But we really, truly need to understand. And then verse 26, he says, And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes. Let me ask you all that. Do you believe this? Yes. Okay. Now we know he's not talking about physical death, right? right? But he's talking about we'll never die spiritually. And one day we are going to spend eternity with him and live forever and ever and ever. Whoever believes in me, the great I am. Mm -hmm. And here is the whole point of the matter. She totally gets it. Look what she says in verse 27. She's a little confused about the resurrection and his, her brother, but look how she refers to Jesus. She says, yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. See the three titles she calls him? Lord, Christ, Son of God. Christ, same thing as Messiah, same thing as Savior. She calls him, you are the Lord, you are the Savior, and by the way, you are Son of God, you are deity, you are God in the flesh. She, she refers to him in all the correct way. And then verse 28, she says, And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. I want to stop right there because that, that verse right there can be a stumbling block, can be so confusing. I just got through praising the woman for calling him Lord, Christ, mm -hmm. and Son of God. And then she turns around the very next verse, and what does she call him? Teacher. What's up with that? <laughs> wow, yeah. I'll tell you what's up with that. It's huge. It's important. It, it's, it's amazing, and unless you know that culture and understand what was going on here, that, see, teacher, rabbi, okay, teacher, it is important to see, see, in that culture, rabbis refused to teach women. They wouldn't have nothing to do with teaching a woman or ministering to a woman like that. But yet she calls him teacher. Why? Because Jesus Christ come to teach all, including her. He was not only her Lord, not only her Christ, not only was he the Son of God, but he was her teacher. He had reached out to her and personally spent time and taught her. She, he was her teacher. Yes. Where in that culture, if you were a woman, a rabbi, which meant teacher, would not teach a woman. It was different than it is now. So that was a huge thing for her to say. That, mm -hmm. that showed the very heart of who Jesus is and who Jesus was and why Jesus came. He came so all people could be saved, right? And he come to teach. He come to educate. He should come to show love, come to show grace, come to show mercy. Not like the Jewish leaders and the rabbis and the Pharisees, only to select in certain people and wouldn't take the time to teach a woman. She called him teacher. <coughs> See how huge that is? If you know that background information. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. 
When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. See, they didn't know that Jesus had showed up, the rest of the people in the house. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She said the same thing as the other sister said. Mm -hmm. See, it wasn't in the realm of their thinking when they first asked for Jesus. They were not expecting Jesus to come and raise their brother from the dead. What they wanted was for Jesus to show up earlier to heal him so he wouldn't die. Just as they had seen him do many miracles in the past. He had raised the lame. He had given sight to the blind. And they knew that Jesus could heal him as well. And that's why I say if he had come earlier, he would not have died. Verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Mm -hmm. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come see, Lord. They replied, and Jesus wept. See the compassion that Jesus showed? Now, many people say, well, it said earlier that he loved these three. That's why he showed the compassion. Do you understand he has this same kind of compassion for everyone? Mm -hmm. This kind of love for everyone? He doesn't want anybody to suffer. And so who was he? Think about this for a minute. Why was he weeping? He knows he's going to bring the man back to life. Because he saw him hurting. So, amen. That's it. So was he weeping for Lazarus? No. He knows Lazarus is coming back to life. He's weeping for these women because they are grieving. They are yeah. hurting. He had empathy and compassion upon them. Even though he knew how it was going to turn out. Mm -hmm. Verse 36 says, Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. Say, they think... He's weeping because of Lazarus. He's weeping because these women are hurting and grieving and crying. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man, blind man have kept this man from dying? See, all of them are thinking the same thing. They're all thinking, Jesus, if you had just showed up earlier, if you had just came earlier, we know you could have kept him from dying. But Jesus had a different plan all along than what they thought the reason he came. Verse 38. Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Does that sound like any other tomb that you've heard about? Yeah. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been for he has been there for four days. Mm -hmm. We all know that the body starts to decay, right? And they're like, oh, we don't want to take a stone away, it's gonna stain. Maybe that's why they believe that the spirit stayed until it's stone. It's part you see, because on the fourth day, think about it, on the fourth day the body really starts to decay. Right. So they had a part to do with it, yeah. So maybe the spirit stuck around until it started stinking. <laughs> I was reading today, and in that country, because it's so, it could be so dry and so hot, stuff like this, that they used to bury a lot of the dead the same day they died, because they would start decaying so quick. Decay oh. fast. Yeah. So you can imagine that how he must have had an odor after oh, four days. Four days yeah. Right, right. Yeah, so think about it. You know, the Lord's saying, hey, you know, roll that stone back, and they're like, I don't know if that's a good idea. It's not going to smell very good in there. He's been, he's been dead four days. You know, they're, they're, they're not even wondering why he wants to roll the stone back. He's just like, I don't want to roll back. It's going to stink. It's going to stink. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? 
So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. See, he, that was all for the benefit of the people. That he's asking the Father something, and the Father is going to respond. He wanted to let the people around him hear him speaking to the Father. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. By the way, that's why I, I believe that's the whole reason for the loud voice, too. Mm -hmm. It's not like it was any more emphasis. He had to speak very loud to get Lazarus. He could have snapped his fingers. He's God. He could have done it any way he wanted. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make sure the people standing there could not only see, but they could hear. This is a really lot in this verse that's a hidden verse if you really don't know. Verse 44. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Mm -hmm. This is not a trick question, but I want you to think about this for just a second before you answer this. Was this man truly resurrected? Is this a resurrection? Or is this a resuscitation? Think about, think about, wait a minute before you answer this. Think about Jesus Christ when he rose from the tomb. Did he come out with his great clothes? No. Where are his great clothes? He left them inside. Left them in the tomb. When this man came out of the tomb, did he have his grave clothes on? Yes. Why do you suppose that is? Is this man going to die again? It's not, Eventually. A, it's not a resurrection. It's a resuscitation. Once we're re truly resurrected, we're not going to die again. And we're not going to need the grave clothes again. That's the significance about the grave clothes still being on the man. When Jesus was truly resurrected, meaning to never die again, mm -hmm. his great clothes were left in the tomb. Folded. Huh? Folded. folded. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. It, yeah. And the reason they were folded was that with that uh, uh, with the Jewish when you get done eating supper, if you fold your napkin up, that means that you will return and, and have a meal again. Yeah. And look at the contrast of this man. The great clothes are still on him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was resuscitated. He was brought back to life by God. But it wasn't a true resurrection. A true resurrection, what the resurrected, to be resurrected like Jesus Christ was, and like we will be, you don't die again. He wouldn't have needed his great clothes anymore. But he brought his great clothes out. He's going to need his great clothes again. He's going to die. He's going to die later. See, that's the difference between the resurrection and the resuscitation. See, And that, by the way, is what they were thinking about the whole three days thing, that maybe the spirit would stick around and somebody could be resuscitated within that three days and come back to life. Isn't that interesting? Think about it. Resurrection. When you're resurrected, do you die again? What does the Word of God tell us? No. You live forever. Jesus rose again from the grave mm -hmm. to live forever and ever and ever in the glorified body that He has. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, when we're resurrected, we're going to have the same kind of glorified body. And guess what? We're going to live forever and ever and ever. That's a resurrection. We don't need the grave clothes. This man still needs the grave clothes because... He wasn't resurrected. He will be someday, but this wasn't the true resurrection. He's going to die again. Does that make sense? Isn't that interesting? It would, but in chapter 25 it says, I am the resurrection. And the life. Okay, I got it now. <laughs> I knew that was going to come up. <laughs> but yeah, and the life. The life is in him. 
He brought him back to life. <laughs> the resurrection is in him. When we're all resurrected, it's going to be in him as well. Amen? Amen. Have you wondered what Lazarus thought when he came walking out? <laughs> well, you know, I always think of, these are the kind of things that I, like when I'm in heaven, you know, think about this. We're going to see Lazarus. But I'm like, I'm going to be like, dude, what was it like to be brought back from the dead by Jesus? I mean, were, were you already, I mean, I got these questions. Were you always, already in paradise? I'm assuming he was. The holding place for the saints, yeah. because they're in paradise before Jesus died on the cross and led them up into the heaven they're in now. You know, so it makes you wonder that whole thing, you know. It's like, wow. He went to Abraham's bosom and they all told him, don't worry, you're going back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's my point. Is it, was he there already? Mm -hmm. Interesting, be interesting. Mm -hmm. So verse 46, no wait, verse 45, I'm going to go ahead and finish the chapter. i got like four or five verses left. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. And hallelujah, I would hope so. You know? I mean, the, the Jesus has been preaching and preaching and preaching, telling him he's the Messiah, that he's the Son of God, that him and the Father are one. And he sees this man being brought back to life. I would hope they would start believing in who he is. Mm -hmm. Verse 46. But look at this. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. It wasn't about believing him. They went to tell, tell the Pharisees. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. Now the Sanhedrin is like the upper courts of the religious mm -hmm. leaders the ruling council what are we accomplishing they asked here is this man performing many miraculous signs and i'd be like yeah he just brought a guy back from the dead he's got to be the messiah he's got to be the savior is that what they say no that's not what they do now if we let him go on like this look here's all they're worried about Everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Like Lori Lee said, they're worried about losing their job. That's all they were worried about. <laughs> worried about losing their job, worried about the Romans. They were worried about there was going to be such a movement started by Jesus and people following him that the Romans were going to come and take the place back over because they were worried about an uprising. Mm -hmm. And they would lose their position in the temple and all the things that they did. Then one of them named uh, Caiaphas, who, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. Now he's right, but his motives are so wrong. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest, that year he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. Not in the way that he thinks. Right. He's going to die on the cross, yes. But he was thinking they would kill him so they could preserve their way of life, the nation that they had, the, the, the old covenant rituals and the temple and everything that they knew. But is that what happened? No. He dies for the nation. He dies for everyone so we can be saved. So he prophesied the correct thing, but his motives are wrong. And his reason for Jesus dying is wrong in what he was thinking. Then he goes on and says, And not only for the nation, but also for the scattered children of God, for bring them together and make them one. Guess what? A lot of them is going to be the Gentiles. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. See, him bringing Lazarus back from the dead, you remember me talking about last week, Jesus knew this was the final nail in his coffin. Jesus knew that this was going to start his journey to the cross. Once he did this, they were going to make sure that they arrested him and he was killed. 
So, from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the desert to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for the ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and they stood in the temple area, and they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the feast at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so they might arrest him. I want to ask you guys a question. We're a little over. I just want to ask this question. And then if there's any comments, then we'll pray and go ahead and leave. But how do you suppose they could hear all the miracles that Jesus did? And now we see a miracle of Jesus Christ literally bringing somebody dead back to life. And their only response was they want to arrest him and they want to kill him. There is only one person ever in Scripture that was prophesied about being able to do these kind of things. And it was the Messiah. And they knew Scripture inside and out. That was their job. They were the pastors of the day. They knew Scripture. They knew the Bible. They knew they knew. So that, you know what is so terrible about that? That's what makes it even worse. But they let the devil be They hardened their heart and they didn't care. Right. For their own selfish reasons, their own selfish ambitions. And that's sad. See, that's way different than being naive and ignorant and not knowing and having a chance to come to know and come to believe they knew and they didn't care and they hardened their heart and wanted nothing to do with them and they wanted to kill them. I truly believe that most of them were coming to the conclusion he truly was the Messiah. But they didn't care. They want to give up their way of life. They didn't want to give up their power. It didn't fit into their idea of what the Messiah was going to do. See, they had it so confused. You've heard me say this before. They were looking for the second coming of the Messiah. They were looking for the conquering king where the, they figured the Jewish nation was going to be on top and they'd do away with the Roman rule and they'd be at the top dogs and they'd be in control and Jesus would be their earthly king. They didn't. They weren't looking for a Messiah to come and die on a cross. See? So they didn't want to hear. They didn't want to give up any other ways of life. And that's really, really sad. There's many people right here, right now, this day, that are the same way. Mm. I don't believe that everyone that you talk to and does not accept the gospel message, it's not because they don't believe. It's worse than that. They don't care. They don't want to give up their life. They don't want to give up control. They don't want to give up their way of life. They don't, just like these people, they don't want to live the life in give Jesus the respect and do the things they should do. It was more about them, their life, and I don't care. I don't want nothing to do with them. And guess what? The reason I said all that was to say this, because I want you guys to partner with me. From let, Let's make, a, let's make a, a, a promise to each other right here, right now, from now till next Wednesday. Brother said something very special in his prayer. It's been in my heart, too. This country needs a huge, 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 huge yes, infusion of Jesus Christ. It, it, it's, getting, it's getting scary. Mm -hmm. It is. But I believe that 99% of the problems, it's not that people truly don't believe, it's they don't care. They're like these people. They don't care. They don't, they don't want to give up their control, their lifestyle, their things. So we need some amazing things to happen in this country to wake people up. Amen. We really, really do. And that's going to, I want to be, let's, let's pray about that tonight before we leave. 
Yeah, no, no, let's let's keep that in prayer the rest of this week. Father, I thank you for who you are and what you've done. I thank you for your great love, your great mercy, Lord. And Jesus, I, I thank you that you've given all the evidence you need to give to prove that who you are. Lord, just help us to be good stewards of your word and good stewards of the Holy Spirit that you've put inside of us and just help us to be able to minister to people in such a way that through us you just open people's eyes, Lord, that more and more people come to know who you are, more and more people get saved. And Lord, I just ask a forgiveness for our country, Lord, and just a huge repentance and turning back to you. And I thank you for that. And Lord, just equip us and strengthen us, strengthen us so we can help do that for your glory and your kingdom. And Father, I just pray for protection for each person in here. And I give you the praise and the thanks for everything good in our lives. In the name above all names of prayer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.